So welcome to uh, 213, uh, the Invisible Committee, and uh, our session today, where, as I said last time, we're going to just start on the deep end of the pool. Uh, so we're starting today to explore these different critical texts. Today it's going to be the Invisible Committee's new book, Now, Maintenant, which came out in 2017, a controversial, provocative uh, intervention in, uh, in contemporary praxis. Uh, it, as you have seen in the posts, it has generated some sharp, some sharp intellectual exchange already, and I'm hoping that we're going to have a great conversation today. Um, I, I, I may need to be the, the defender, uh, which I, I, <laughs> I tend to be often in my life, um, but we'll see. Uh, I, I need to, no, the other way around, all of them. Could you put them all on? That'd be great. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, which I tend to be often, but uh, I, I did find an enormous amount of rich, theoretical work in here, particularly as Etienne had just been suggesting around this notion of destitution um, that I think we'll have a good conversation about today. Uh, and so we are thrilled to have with us today three brilliant critical thinkers uh, who are going to uh, start with uh, some interventions. You've read their posts on the uh, website and uh, then after that, we'll go into conversation uh, with uh, Emmanuel Sada and Jesus Velasco opening up the conversation, and Stoller, Stathis, uh, and, uh, and, and everyone else. So uh, our, in order of, uh, of their presentations today, we're going to start with Judith Revel, who uh, has just arrived from Paris, and we're terribly grateful to her for making the trip. She's a professor of philosophy. Many of you know her because she has participated uh, so generously in our previous 1313s. A uh, professor of philosophy at the University of Paris uh, at Nanterre, uh, where she's also a member of the Sophia Paul Laboratory uh, and director of the research project Discipliner l'Archive. Uh, she's a specialist, well, in many uh, contemporary thinkers. Of course, Michel Foucault, but also uh, Deleuze, Derrida, Merleau-Ponty, Lefort, Clastre, uh, Castoriadis, Rancière, Agamben, Esposito, uh, so many uh, modern thinkers. Uh, she's written several books, including uh, Foucault, Experience de la Pensée, uh, Foucault, Une Pensée du Discontinu, uh, Foucault avec Merleau-Ponty, uh, Ontologie Politique, uh, and she directed the Italian edition of Foucault's DNA Écrit, and we're thrilled to have you back, Judith. Thank you so much. Um, after Judith, we will hear from, um, yes, I'm getting my alphabet correctly here, Jackie Wang, who we're thrilled, who just arrived, uh, coming in from Harvard University, uh, where she is in the Department of American, African American Studies and History. And she's recently published a book in this series, actually, in the series of semiotechs. So if you look at the back of your uh, semiotext, uh, there she is, uh, Jackie Wang, Carceral Capitalism. Uh, it's a text inspired by her own brother's imprisonment in Florida, uh, for which we are all sorry. Um, this text received particular attention from the Los Angeles Review of Books, which acknowledged the Jackie Wang's contribution to a series of questions, quote, about the forces arrayed against real justice, surveillance, technopolitics, colorblindness, exploitation, and extraction that occurs close to and far from home. Uh, her next book is The Twitter Hive Mind is Dreaming, and it's uh, forthcoming from RoboCup Press. And she also publishes punk zines, right? Uh, including On Being Hard Femme Lies, a journal of materialist feminism, publishing her essay uh, Against Innocence uh, in 2012. So welcome, uh, Jackie. And then after that, we'll hear from Mackenzie Wark, uh, who currently serves as chair and professor of culture and media at the New School for Social Research. Oh, I'm on leave. Oh, okay, good. All right. So, uh, who is a professor on leave? 
fortunate, uh, fortunate to be on leave. Uh, his most recent publications include General Intellects, uh, 21 Thinkers for the 21st Century in 2017, and Molecular Red, uh, Theory for the Anthropocene in 2015. Uh, he's authored many books, chapters, articles, and multimedia project. And uh, he's, uh, he's had a number of uh, awards, um, spent time, uh, let's see, awards with the Andy Warhol Foundation, Creative Capital Art Writers Grant, MacArthur Foundation, et cetera, and a residency with the iBeam Art and Technology Center, among others. So we're thrilled to have you with us, Ken, as well. So we're going to start with uh, Judith. And um, here we go. OK, um, thank you once again this year for this uh, very exciting seminar and for this invitation. And once again, sorry for my English, which is not so good. Um, let's start with an observation. The, the recent writings of the Invisible Committee are extremely popular uh, in France among young people and particularly among students. And I, if, if I mention this generational element, it's uh, because it embodies uh, the central diagnosis of the book, a disaster that has never been so deep and which determines for the youngest an experience of the world that we, uh, all those people, are not able to share. Of course, we can share the refusal, the indignation, uh, the will to resist and fight back, but we are not able to share the essential perception upon which the book is built. A fragmentation, uh, the word is uh, used by the book, a fragmentation of the world which is so deep that only a complete denunciation of all pre-existing hypotheses becomes legitimate. Um, the book came out in France, uh, you said it, uh, Bernard, last year on April 21st, exactly 15 years after Jean-Marie Le Pen, the extreme right candidate, faced Jacques Chirac, the classical right candidate, in the second round of the French presidential elections. No need to remind you what you already know, Jacques Chirac won the vote with more than 80%. And the French people discovered an awful new situation um, that defending democracy sometimes requires voting for the opposite of one's own ideas. The election certainly marks a kind of uh, tear, a split in the practice of political representation and the conception of its validity. The 18, 25 years old of today are precisely those who grew up in the wake of 2002. They are the kids of 2002. And if you add to this kind of landscape other elements that we all have in mind, the crushing of social movements at the J8 in Genoa in 2001, for example, of course 9-11, the financial crisis of 2008, uh, the terrorist attacks in Paris in 2015. Last year, the repetition of the mechanism of 2002, Marine Le Pen, instead of his father, uh, her father, facing Emmanuel Macron on the second round of the presidential election, and the rise of nationalist, fascist, and populist movements. You have an idea of what the world looks like for young people. Does it look the same for us, the other two? Or not. Yes, but we have known something else, and it's a big difference. So, yes, the book is right. Uh, recognizing the disaster is unavoidable. But what bothers me is not this starting point. It's, it's a way in, uh, it engages with a conception of political struggle that seems to me um, terribly hollowed out, rarefied, aestheticized. As we have a short time, I try to proceed by, by points. So first point, the presentism of now, the book. Uh, some years ago, Francois Artaud suggested that uh, contemporary thought could be read through the hypothesis that we have lost both our ties to the past and our capacity to project into the future, that we have lost the sense of great historical narratives and utopian constructions, and that we are stuck in a kind of 
compressed history in the soul dimension of the event, the immediate, the evanescent. I do not believe that uh, Hartog's hypothesis works in general. Um, there are many counterexamples to disprove his theory. However, the book now is a strange case of presentism, just as Hartog defines it, because the text is based upon two highly debatable principles. First, that history always means continuity, and thus suffocates novelty. Second, that the future, whatever his form, its forms, always implies something like a project, which itself necessarily implies some kind of reformism. Uh, the variations on that theme are many in the book, from the idea that any revolution fatally reproduces what is opposed to the eulogy of the cortege de tête. Uh, no temporal thickness should weigh down the purity of the moment, l'instant, as if uh, the relations to the past or to the future precisely could never be conceived on the mode of discontinuity. Well, if something is really important in this seminar on praxis, it seems to me that it's precisely the idea of the possibility of a discontinuity in history, into history. In the book, uh, this discontinuity, this rupture, is uh, exclusively interpreted through deprived, negative, subtractive figures. Uh, I will come to that in a minute. Destitution, um, this is hard to pronounce, inoperativeness, yeah? Uh, the Agambenian inoperosita, it's uh, easier in, Ita in Italian, uh, exodus. But before I, I get to those figures, I, I'd like to stress that uh, this erasure of history implies several things. First, um, by reducing any situation to the tip of the moment, the text erases uh, all we could call historical determinations all what determines socially, politically, economically, culturally, ecologically, a precise situation. Uh, the landscape of a young born in uh, 1998 is quite different from the landscape of a man or woman born around 68, my case. Of course, historical determinations do not imply historical determinism, but they speak for the singularity of a situation, and there is no possible diagnosis of a situation without careful attention to the material conditions that makes lives that they are at a given time. And of course, these actual conditions also determine the possible terrain of the struggles. But now the book uh, seems to completely dissociate the two. It poses an intense diagnosis as a starting point, but proceeds with a complete indifference to the actual conditions of subjection, of suffering, uh, of the plunder of lives. Of course, the book records the very specificity of the present, especially when it comes to criticizing technology, or when it criticizes Amazon, car sharing platforms, and more generally, the widespread commodification of our lives. But when one reads that, I quote the text, what is truly political is only what emerges from life and makes it a definite oriented reality, end of quote. One wonders how much attention the authors paid to real existence other than their own existence. Lives, affects, revolts, working conditions, or lack of work, worries, relationships, relations of power, relation to space, relations to time, these things seem to be erased in the void of a world reduced to the only dimension of the moment. Once again, l'instant. Um, what stupefies here is the emptiness of the analysis, and I'm going to give you an example. Um, the text uh, justifiably criticized nostalgia as a reactionary principle, and yet, he has some surprisingly nostalgic moments, for instance, when he talks about what life should be from a situated point of view, which is the one of the authors, but which is not said as such, and which is clearly a class situation. Uh, once upon a time, we are told, uh, the spare bedroom was for friends, 
and not for Airbnb. Once upon a time, long rides were an opportunity to daydream or to pick up a hitchhiker rather than a chance to sign up for care share. Um, we would give out our old furniture to friends and family, not sell it uh, on com some, some Craigslist website. And, and the book concludes with a uh, theory of a uh, douchebag, une théorie de crevard, which sounds in French more like a seedy, shabby, pathetic person than a, a real douchebag. It's a problem of translation, I think. Uh, crevard is a, a, a very pathetic person. Um, the theory of this kind of individual who is a utilitarian, optimizing creature, who counts, uses, turns into profit, whatever he owns, and whatever he is, capital, human capital. Okay, I'd like to answer. Uh, in what social world do men and women have spare bedrooms to offer, time to daydream in their car, and uh, can afford to renew their furniture? In what social world today can people afford not to count and optimize? Of course, it doesn't mean we have to legitimize or justify the widespread commodification of human relation, which is awful. Of course, it's awful. Uh, but simply interrogate a discourse that seems to me both aristocratic and prescriptive. A discourse which doesn't see or doesn't want to see its own class situation, the class situation from which the, this discourse tells others what they are. Pick your side, comrade. Are you a seedy, pathetic person or not? Uh, thus, the text involuntarily raises the question, does praxis imply to tell others what they are, to speak for others, uh, about others? I believe uh, we are paying a high price for that kind of uh, overhanging position in Europe and in the US. The hatred of the elite from Trump to Salvini or Orban in Hungary uh, is haunting politics. Elites used to be considered as the super rich, the bankers, the financiers. Today, and that should probably be considered one of the defining traits of the new populism, the hatred of the elites is directed towards academics, book readers, theater lovers, travelers. The hatred is addressed to us, uh, us who have spare bedrooms and time to daydream. Of course, it doesn't not mean that, that the, this uh, new hatred is good or justified. It's clearly fascistic. But it means that we have to perceive the extent to which our blindness has fueled this hatred. Our world is not the world in general. <coughs> Second element. Uh, and first quoting of this kind of uh, aristocratism, a philosophy of bodies. Uh, to cover the complete disappearance of class elements and also the, the, the class contempt, which somehow transpires in the text, um, the book executes several operations. Uh, the first is to reduce uh, the lives as socially determined existences to bodies. The reference to bodies has, uh, of course, a central pl place in, in contemporary French philosophy. Of course, Deleuze and Guattari, often referred to in the text, or Foucault and others. But here, bodies allow the book not to think about the possibilities of subjectivation the way in which subjects who are told, defined, governed, prescribed by others one day decide to speak and act for themselves. Um, the vitalist impetus to which the text refers to, let us remind the, uh, of the main argument of the book, in this fragmented world, small autonomous nuclei are freeing themselves and their strength and energy is visible in the deployment of the bodies in the cortege de tête. The vitalist impetus uh, neglects what also makes the bodies, because bodies are more than this. Um, I think the book is aware, partially aware of the problem, but only when it's faced by others. For example, um, the Comité Invisible rightly points out the political weakness of uh, the new Nuit Debout experience uh, in Paris, 2016. Um, two years ago, some of us uh, have indeed asked in that 
great, uh, great uh, uh, festive display of Nuit Debout, where, uh, where the non-white -right, uh, people, uh, the, the inhabitants of the banlieue, the non-Parisians, where? Well, I believe that the same question should be asked about the cortege de tête in the uh, Invisible Committee version. Uh, the issue is not about the violence of the cortege de tête, about the moral judgment on the casseurs, uh, about the denunciation of their non-representativity in respect to the rest of the cortege. The issue is that the cortege de tête is composed of bodies who are not just bodies, but lives. Lives in which, precisely, one mostly knows what is uh, to daydream, to take the car for an escapade, to have a spare bedroom at home and a bookshelf full of books. Lives who cannot imagine that others may not even be able to imagine that kind of life. The political question starts when we ask how to also aggregate the lives of the banlieue, the lives of the underqualified, the lives of those who hang out in a staircase, uh, the lives of housekeepers, rationalized persons, precarious workers, migrants, all those who are fundamental actors of any social transformation because they live most profoundly the immediate violence of capital, the sucking of lives by the capital. Uh, second quoting of uh, aristocratism, the disqualification of the social. Uh, I used uh, the adjective social in various expressions, social determination, social position, social qualification of, 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 of lives. Uh, the book prefers to talk uh, about the social corpse. Of course, we have to share the criticism of the modern opposition between the society and the state, when society is at best imagined as a compensatory mechanism against the failings and violence of the state or as a counter-democracy that would replace uh, the literal disintegration of traditional democratic mechanism. It is also easy to share the will of disarticulation of another pair, society versus the individual. Society being so often presented as uh, the space in which the individual is overcome by a sense of collective belonging, uh, which is in many cases false and artificial. Society, usually uh, in quotation marks in the book, must then be deconstructed as a mystification that, is, uh, uh, that it, it actually is. But, but the abolition of any reference to a social dimension ends up making lives incomprehensible where are the extreme multiplicity of relations of power, the variability of their intensity and scale, their stratification, the intersection of their effects, the transformation of their rationality? Not a word is said about that in the book. What is then the real, material, tangible space in which what the book calls fragmentation takes place? Third point, third quoting uh, of aristocratism, a cortege de tête policy. Uh, the denunciation of the cortege de tête in the French mainstream media, and of course in a political discourse from the left as well from the right, maybe more from the left, uh, led us to disgusting variation on the theme of violence, non-violence, and have been translated immediately into a will to distinguish the good demonstrator from the bad one, both being in any case gassed and beaten by the police in France. Uh, the book is absolutely right to recall that, and it's necessary to recall that. Having said that, uh, there is no basis on which to assume that the cortege de tête is a political actor. Of course, the invisible committee takes some oratorical precautions. They don't speak of uh, political subjectivity, but a political receptacle, a gesture inscribed in a present uh, of the moment, a situation, and gradually throughout the text, the cortege de tête ends up becoming a space, the space of a specific experimentation embodying a certain assemblage, agencement, the Deleuzean term. But the question of the very conditions of possibility of this assemblage is never asked. How is possible? 
The question remains unanswered. I quote, to love is never to be together, but to become together. I absolutely agree with that. But what about the condition of that becoming together? How does that becoming ignite? The Invisible Committee essentially mentions negative characteristics. It's not about collective. It's not about unity. We have, of course, to avoid every idea of the unity. I agree with that. It's not a form. It's not about detotalization. The text says it's an experience. What kind of experience? Can it uh, be transmitted or not? And if not, does it mean that this experience is only valid in the very instant it happens? Sometimes the text tolerates for itself what it denies to others. I quote, what is truly political is only what emerges from life and makes it a definite oriented reality. And it's born from what is nearby and not from a projection towards the far distant. The nearby doesn't mean the restricted, the limited, the narrow, the local. It means rather what is in tune, vibrant, adequate, present, sensible, luminous, and familiar, the prehensible and comprehensible, end of quote. I just like to know what these words entail, in tune, vibrant, adequate, sensible, luminous, and so on. I, I'd like to know if this isn't simply a return to some really great and poetic avant-garde way of thinking, since the very last line of the book seems to suggest just that. I quote again, the only thing capable of transversally uniting all the elements deserting this society into a historical party is, uh, uh, oh, I lost my text, yeah, is uh, an intelligence of situation. Based on that intelligence, an occasional vertical expedient needed to tilt certain situations in the desired direction can well be improvised. End of quote. A nice return to Leninism in a text so fiercely anti-Leninist. Um, last point, if I have four minutes, three minutes. Uh, the call to communism as hatred of uh, the assembly. The text reaches the culmination of its argument with the, the idea of communism. Here again, the argument is twofold. On one hand, a diagnosis, the necessity to tear the idea of communism from its historical incarnations. On the other hand, a prospective point of view, and that's where things get complicated. Complicated because the text affirms different things in the same time. In the same, in the same time. Uh, first, and I believe that we can agree with that, the common defined as what is given as a shared experience has nothing to do with the traditional forms of the collective. These collective forms should be analyzed for what they are, mostly empty mystifications. Second, the fragmentation of the world releases a kind of power of the common, puissance du commun, in the form of a proliferation of assemblages between singularities. The example given in the text is that of the ZAD Notre Dame des Landes, de, de Landes uh, Zone à défendre Notre Dame des Landes. Um, I quote, new collective realities, new constructions, new encounters, new thoughts, new customs, new arrivals in every sense, with the confrontations arising necessarily from the rubbing together of words and ways of being, end of quote. However, once again, the condition of these new rubbing together of words and ways of being are only negatively defined. Every creation is born of a splitting off from the whole, laceration, tearing away, fragmentation. Uh, that's the reason why the word destitution uh, is so central in the text, not, or not only as the destitution of what must be overthrown, uh, it's the reference to Marx's German ideology, communism is the real movement that destitutes the existing state of things, uh, quoted by the, the, the book. Uh, but as a form of pure political power, the destitution as puissance pure. The problem is that it's not enough, because we need more. 
they say, and they also say, without at least the occasional experience of community, we die inside, we dry out, end of quote. And um, uh, last element, and, and this is really a problematic statement for me, any questioning about the material conditions of possibility of something as a common becoming, or what the authors call becoming together, um, necessarily reintroduced from them the principle uh, of an order. Of course, we should seriously criticize the militant methods of construction of the collective order. Uh, but by the end of the book, again, it radicalizes its stance. Whenever the form is questioned, it's a ruse of the collective. As such, any reflection on the modes of assembly and the organization, even if its goal is to experience new modes of assemblages, is disqualified in advance. Even the horizontality is characterized as nothing but the new expression of uh, a transcendent vertically of uh, uh, commandment. The question of organization is still and always, says the text, uh, the Leviathan. I have in mind the title of a beautiful text that Foucault wrote in response to the controversy about uh, the comments on the Iranian revolution. We uh, spoke about it uh, last year here. Uh, the text uh, is titled, is it useless to revolt? Here the question could be, is it useless to assemble? Uh, my, my, my last, last, last point will be extremely short, uh, 30 seconds. I'd like to ask what is the viability of a thought that seeks to radically destitute, to desubjectify, to idle, to substract. Not that one shouldn't seek to overthrow, to destitute the other things. Not that one shouldn't denounce the modes in which subjects are objectified, crushed between their duty to be good individuals, producers, egocentric consumers, psychologized persons, and so on, and the way in which they are asked in the same time more and more to declare their collective belongings. Uh, not that one shouldn't be able to escape, to be elsewhere. Of course, we have to. But what happens if we get rid of the constituent dimension of the praxis. The invisible committee again tolerates for itself what it refuses for, uh, to, to others. In, in their text, there is a kind of a crypto Deleuzean vitalism which refers itself to the idea of a puissance at the very heart of assemblages. This is the magical word uh, which allows to explain the uprising, the new agencement assemblages, and that places this puissance without any mediation in the life. I quote, if communism has a goal, it is the great health of forms of life. This great health is obtained through a patient rearticulation of the disjoint members of our being in touch with the life. Life gradually gives form to whoever refuses to live, to live besides themselves, to whoever allows themselves to experience they become a form of life in the full sense of the term, end of quote. I, I don't have time uh, to comment on the Agambenian accents of this analysis and the way in which destitution rests upon the use of the Agambenian concept of inoperosita, once again, which also combines in uh, uh, Agamben the idea of a retreat from the world on one hand and the power, puissance of bodies on the other, a power of the bodies as idle bodies, subtracted from the very idea of work, not labor, work, production, social production. All I would say is that all things considered, I think I prefer Bartleby, uh, Bartleby's version of idleness. Um, I would prefer not to. There was no need for an elegant quote from Heiner Müller on the superiority of communism as I quote, absolute solitude for us to catch a glimpse of what this uh, kind of aestheticized rarefaction of praxis can lead to. Thank you, Judith. Thank you. And thank you so much for connecting this work back to our discussion of uh, the, the Foucault in Iran at, during the uprising 1313, because I think that that's really 
an interesting and important point of connection. And when you ask the question, you know, is it useless to assemble? Right, that's uh, that's very that's very provocative. I mean, I, and and it, of course, it also raises the question: is it is it useless to to destitute or also all of the other kind of revolt impulses that are in the book? Um, and so, one question then. One important question then becomes: How do we how do we distinguish between these revolt impulses, really, right? Um, uh, and and how they go, and in, in, in how do, how do we tranch them, even when they're there, uh, and so powerful? Okay, wonderful. Um, next, we turn to Jackie Wang, and uh, how do you want to do this? Yeah, I'll, I'll turn put it on there. Thank you. It's um, surreal to be here because I'm I'm kind of of the generation that you're speaking yeah. about, and I was raised on this literature. Um, at one point in anarchist circles, my skepticism towards this literature was so well known that I was accused of writing an, an anonymous critique of Takun and the Invisible Committee that I didn't write, and this was on... Um, Anarchist News, does the website still exist? There were really epic um, flame wars on that, on the comments section. Um, but I've since kind of come around to dimensions um, of this literature, and in particular, the techno-pessimism really speaks to me. So my favorite text uh, to come out of this scene is actually the cybernetic hypothesis, but nobody really reads or talks about that text. Um, and I don't even think it was uh, officially published in English, although there were bootleg translations. Um, I don't think it's necessarily accurate, but it is, um, it's my favorite. There's a lot of interesting um, analyses of, of cybernetic decentralized governance. Um, but I'm going to read um, a piece that I wrote for this occasion this weekend, um, and I should give a trigger warning for sexual violence. Um, this piece is called Trauma Monsters and Feminist Forms of Life. I write this from a place of exhaustion. I am exhausted by rape culture, by the spectacle of politics, by the recuperation of every rupture. Fatigue forecloses presence to ourselves, makes us insensate. A widely circulated Instagram story reads, quote, love to those of us who can't participate or give a hot take, whose ways of coping are messy and necessary and unseen, end quote. Who or what has absconded with my voice? Commentaries on our involuntary silence or an incitement to discourse, how violation reverberates across time to touch what is often bracketed. A proximity we didn't ask for from which there is no escape. What is the distance between action and discourse, between embodied gesture and dead symbol, when snatches of the real break through and are transmitted by the quavering voice. It's in her voice, it's in her voice that we break. At the moment the lid was blown off, I had nothing to say. I was walking across a bridge over the Charles River at night, watching Christine Blassie Ford's testimony on my phone, ensconced in my symbolic bubble, hovering above the river at the moment she was asked to conjure a vivid detail about that night. She spoke of the laughter of the boys the laughter that ricochets across the decades and becomes the refrain of a life. It was on the bridge that I was pierced, but by what? At some point, I had had enough. From the distance, I observed people's manner of inhabiting the effective rupture. 
Some shared stories of trauma. Others became trenchant, issued warnings to leftist bros, we're coming to get you next. Some posted memes, like the one of Samuel L. Jackson in Pulp Fiction spliced with Kavanaugh's evasive responses. Others changed their Facebook avatar to include the caption, I believe survivors. What happens when what people do to each other behind closed doors becomes known, when the unsayable enters the public sphere? Is what emerged in its wake something akin to the situation the Invisible Committee wrote about in Now? Or has the eruption of rage towards male domination already been neutralized and contained by the solutions we have been handed, a limited FBI investigation and electoral politics? Does placing hope in the state to adjudicate and deliver justice placate those who are filled with rage? And does it lead to the deferral of collective action? As the Invisible Committee write, quote, to call for justice in the face of this world is to ask a monster to babysit your children. Anyone who knows the underside of power immediately ceases to respect it, end quote. How do we maintain a connection to the unruly feelings that have been unleashed? Contact with the real is sometimes unexpected. Did we experience it as a collective destabilization? What becomes possible in the space of the fissure? I wanted to say nothing, but what I banished from my memory kept appearing on the periphery of my vision. I recalled a recent psychoanalysis session when Dr. C spoke of my brother's resentencing hearing how we barely discussed what was revealed there, but not revealed, alluded to diagon diagonally. What a way to find out, she said, what happened to your mother. In the courtroom, in the sterile temple of the law, a psychologist was about to offer testimony about my mother's trauma a gang rape I later discovered, but before she could testify, the prosecutor stood up to offer my brother a deal to commute his juvenile life without parole sentence to 40 years. It was as though he too could not tolerate what the psychologist was about to say about my mother. My analyst's reference to the courtroom discovery was a shock. I had written it out of my conscious awareness. I had erased it from the official account. It appears nowhere in the book. What is the self-sealing mechanism of the body when it is put through too much? The psychogenic fugue state is a spectrum the story is in the silences. Here, I have deviated from the prompt, but the prompt calls for a meditation on now. It only makes sense to speak from the moment I presently inhabit while attending to the situation at hand. If the present is the pr privileged temporal position, because it is the time of now, of decision, um, i.e. the past has been decided, tomorrow will never arrive, then what remains unexamined is the temporal wormhole called trauma, which can fix subjects to a moment in the past. To dwell in such a space is to inhabit the past as though it were present. It is the meaning of being haunted. What kind of decisionism is possible here? There is an air of contempt towards so-called victim discourse in now when the Invisible Committee writes, 
Here, criticism doesn't work. To limit oneself to denouncing discriminations, oppressions, and injustices, and expect to harvest the fruit of that is to get one's epochs wrong. Leftists who think they can make something happen by lifting the lever of bad conscience are sadly mistaken. They can go and scratch their scabs in public and air their grievances, hoping to arouse sympathy as much as they like. They'll only give rise to contempt and the desire to destroy them. Victim has become an insult in every part of the world." End quote. Yes, there is an excess of critique, but this moment reveals the continuity be between speech and gesture. And yet, I have often resented this compulsion to discourse in the so-called genre of the female complaint, resent that I must table all the other political questions I could theorize, the topics usually left to the men, such as the relationship between technological development and the expansion of the sphere of valorization, which is the topic I initially came here to discuss. I wanted to write about the police, about how the imperative to become ungovernable sometimes slyly masks the governmentality of the masculine. What would it mean for women, trans, and gender non-conforming people to become ungovernable? The motivation underlying attempts to dismiss a kind of politics crudely labeled identity politics is often fear, fear of feminist revolt. I wanted to write that in a world where measurement and valorization aims to capture life itself, why is it that what women do counts for nothing? Whether it's caring for aging family members or the untallied acts of emotional labor which together constitute the world. Everything is under the regime of measurement except that which is coded feminine. And yet, what does this neglect, this failure to register certain gestures afford us? Opacity can shelter certain forms of domination that occur on the terrain of the intimate, but it can also foster forms of intimacy that resist capture and work against domination. In the latter case, defense of the feminine is preservation of the incalculable. This leads me to my last point, to the question of forms of life. When the Invisible Committee write about the experience of continuity, which they place at the center of their imminent conception of communism, they continually highlight two experiences, love and riots. They write, quote, in the riot, there is an incandescent presence to oneself and to others, a lucid fraternity which the republic is quite incapable of generating. The organized riot is capable of producing what this society cannot create, lively and irreversible bonds. In the riot, there is a production and affirmation of friendships, a focused configuration of the world, clear possibilities of action, means close at hand, end quote. If this were true, the history of anarchist revolt would not include a litany of betrayals and severed ties. Rioters know that co-conspirators can easily become snitches. But under what conditions do we remain friends? Bonds are not formed automatically in the now, but in the duration, in the creation of new rhythms of being, rooted in the reproduction of everyday life. What forms of life support the building of bonds across time? 
I think of the feminist sleepovers that spontaneously emerged out of a reading group in Baltimore, or the feminist commune I once imagined in an interview. At the feminist commune, we feast and talk all night, fast, irreverent, real, smart. We do nail art divination and theorize and watch music videos on YouTube and critique Lana Del Rey. The conversation moves with ease from the everyday to the global. Politics is always imagined according to a range of scales, cellular, psychological, social, economic, earthly, cosmic. Even the invisible must be thought, what is imperceptible or not yet thought. Everything that is said comes from a place. Here are women who are intellectually sincere, genuinely curious and concerned with figuring shit out, not to try to prove anything, not trying to master knowledge for the sake of mastery. At the feminist commune, there are a lot of beds and rooms for people to work in. There are books everywhere, gardens outside, herbs in the windowsills, fruit trees in the yard. There is a river behind the main house, and we are always swimming in it. There are caves nearby where some of the residents go to light candles and meditate. Everyone is very different. The nerd of the commune is never without a book, and she has a very rich and imaginative inner life. One woman is always making herbal tinctures or recommending remedies for the residents' respective ailments. Another is always gardening. Another is busy on her computer, counter-hacking the NSA. Doorway lined with powerful magnets, in preparation for that fateful day when the FBI kicks in her door and seizes her hardware. Though sleep schedules sometimes diverge, the women converge around the sharing of food. Conflicts get intense. Some leave, some return. Some try to form alliances based on the exclusion of so-and-so. Not everything can be worked through. Some residents have been to college, and this affects how they communicate. Some have not been to college. Some have been with cisgender men and still have ties to them. Others don't. Some can't stand not being the best all the time, though they feel bad about it. Others feel too timid to talk and get quiet around the residents who are voluble and loquacious. Their weird or witty side might come out when they are talking to someone one-on-one, -on -one, or a gregarious mood strikes in the form of a mysterious confidence. We have been made by this fucked up world, and so are flawed. But we interact in good faith. It is hard to know why we do what we do, but we are smart enough to know when we are wrong. There's a lot more that I could say about feminist forms of life, but I will leave it at that, half-mapped. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie, and um, we'll we'll uh, we'll come back to those questions in the in the conversation shortly. Um, and the no, the no, particularly the notions of kind of uh, betrayal and that that I thought are so interesting and relevant uh, in the context of uh, militant action. So next, we turn to Ken Wark. I like to quote a lot, so I'm just going to do that. Uh, you know, so some it's me, some it's not. But no. uh, the text of now begins with a critical devaluation of an already devalued language. Having become an instrument of communication, 
language is no longer its own reality. And the exchange value of language has fallen to zero. Against which it asserts as the sole criteria for truth moments of spontaneous immediate action. Truth is a complete presence to oneself and to the world of vital contact with the real and acute perception of the givens of existence. Now, elsewhere, I've been critical of this aspect of the Invisible Committee text. There's a very thin line between lionizing anarchist direct action and fascist direct action, particularly when it's kinds that are the province of young men. And Jackie has this covered, so I'll just condense it down into two questions. You know, what would a femme riot look like? And what would a disabled riot look like? That would be very different things. And why I think Ben starts to think there's a kind of hidden uh, commitment to a universality of, in the figure of riot that's suppressed in this text because it can only have one form, which is like boys rioting. Uh, now takes forward the critique of the whole as the false. That's a keynote uh, in the texts of uh, Keep the Board. The institutional structures that mediate between the totality and particular situations are now seen to be falling apart of their own accord. The world is fragmenting. Hegemony is dead. The, state, the states can no longer maintain themselves except in the form of holograms. Uh, and as in the late Paul Virilio, there was only civil war. And yet each fragment carries its own possibility of perfection. I don't think it actually sounds like uh, Henri Lefebvre, uh, the gesture of totalization. Just occurred to me. In a striking phrase, there will be no common salvation. Now abandons any sense that the negation of this false totality will in the end, uh, will be in the end the true one. Uh, there's no just law to replace the unjust ones. It is the time of the abolition of the law. Key to this doctrine is the abandoning of Marx's figure of the working class as bearer, if not of a new universality, then of a condition that is abstract and generalizable. Under the gale force of capital's dynamism, all that is solid melts into air, all that is sacred is profaned. But the possibility thus emerges of a way of being and acting in the world that's no longer the arbitrary result of a particular inheritance, or at least that's maybe what Marx wanted. Rather, all there is in now are singular forms of life. For Marx, capital is a becoming abstract of social labor, which is yet constrained by the particulars of capitalist exploitation. It is only to burst through this fetter to realize an even higher form of abstraction, which in a dialectical twist returns social labor to a new relation to the earth. Or so at least some who followed uh, through on this aspect of Marx, such as Alexander Bogdanov, might have thought. Curiously, now abandons the historical tendency to abstraction, but retains the commitment to novelty. And in that sense, the text remains modern, and perhaps more modern than it knows. It's all about new collective realities, new constructions, new encounters, new thoughts, new customs, new arrivals in every sense. Uh, and this, I think, sits oddly with its occasional gestures towards indigenous forms of life. Communism is yet a return to the earth. And realizing the promise of communism contains in the world's fragmentation uh, demands a gesture, a gesture to be performed over and over again, a gesture that is life itself, that of creating pathways between the fragments. And life comes up a lot, as Judith had mentioned. And there's a kind of quaint vitalism uh, that underlies the whole text, as if vitalism, vitalism had not been pretty much abandoned in the natural sciences in the 1930s. I mean, come on. Sorry. Um, but this is a vitalism, of course, known only to the poets. The one hierarchy that remains in place here is that of activist and poetic forms of knowledge practice over all others. The kind of activism involved uh, that's valorized is itself a kind of poetry of the streets. So in a sense, these two forms of knowledge, the activist and poetic, are the same. What makes the text really, to me, frankly, the same old boring will to power is the desire that poetry should be made by all and made in the streets as a sovereign form. What remains unthinkable is that different forms of knowing and acting might have comradely relations, that there might be a cooperative labor across the differences between ways of knowing and acting, now as a comradeship only of friends in sameness. Once these sees this in the Media Theory for Kids section, which seems to have come from watching old episodes of Black Mirror, 
It gestures to infrastructure but really doesn't know much about it. And we get some quaint gestures to cybernetics. Again, sorry, Jackie, you know I hate this part of it. I really do. <laughs> Even though I, 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 I kind of am, I'm on board with the aim. It's just it's harder to do than it looks. Um, so, yes, yeah, cybernetics, and that people still talk about it would make the ghost of Norbert Wiener happy. But, you know, provocation number one, any political theory that does, that does not know who Claude Shannon was and why he matters is still in the mid-20th century. Second provocation, does French political thought still have anything to teach the world or has it become provincial? <laughs> is, the fate of, is it the fate for second-tier states in the overdeveloped world? Is it still of general interest? Uh, let alone the kind of uh, political thought that's being generated. Is the uh, fragmentation that, that's the, one of the leitmotifs of the text, uh, which seems to me to be a gesture made contrary to all known reality, uh, a kind of an effect of the experience of that decline of power? One appears as a fragment of a world system and no longer in charge of it. So ironically, the French state might be more deeply embedded in this text than it would ever want to acknowledge. Uh, and I'm also interested in the casual use of the adjective serial for a kind of crowd. Uh, one might wonder if uh, Jean-Paul Sartre still casts a huge shadow, even over those who thought they'd had done with him. The myth of the incalculable revolt hangs over a lot of post-war French political thinking, uh, crystallized in uh, Sartre's theory of the fused group. Interesting exception, actually, is, again, is the board uh, for whom uh, the game of war is uh, training in politics for operating in the fog but through calculation. It's the opposite of poetry in the streets. Now, repeats the critique of the model of the General Assembly, uh, which Judith already gestured to, um, which gets a more positive spin in uh, Judith Butler. Butler's attention to the variability and vulnerability of bodies makes a useful counterpoint to the robust and maybe somewhat masculinist health uh, and vitalism here on which see Klaus Tableite, yeah? Uh, but both, I think, suffer from a uh, privileging of, of the living over the dead in the sense that infrastructure, those sedimentary layers and deposits of dead labor, is kind of barely thinkable in the text. One has to concede that now uh, is not entirely wrong about the narcissism of general assemblies. Uh, I did my own modest psychogeography of Sakati Park in 2011, but I actually found the space contained four kinds of activities organized in a, like a cross form. The General Assembly at one end and at the other end of the pole, the drum circle. Uh, and at right angles to that axis, there's an area of services such, in, such as food and electricity. And the other end of that axis was art. So there were actually four activities going on. And when the police showed up, everybody mobilized with varying degrees of enthusiasm. I'm a coward, so I like to run away. Uh, also, I'm not a citizen, so I didn't want to get arrested. Uh, and the lesson might be the equality and comradely connection between these forms rather than the sovereignty of the poetics of direct action. Uh, There's a somewhat alarming passage on Richard Dern, who killed people at a town council meeting in Monté in 2002. And on this uh, now can be contra contrasted with Bernard Stigler, who talks about the same event in terms of the collapse of the long loops of connection across time in favor of various technically enabled short circuits. And in what way is the right another form of short circuit? Uh, but Stiegler would want to replace our eroding institution with forms on a far bigger scale than the visible committee. Uh, I thought it was promising that the text started to question the givenness of politics as a category, but it actually doesn't go very far with this. Politics ends up being defined as a conflict between forms of life. Uh, and it draws, like, yet again on Schmidt's basically Nazi political thought, which makes friend-enemy distinction the basis of politics as, as a distinct and sovereign realm, sovereign over the others. Uh, and it's such, so many different kind of, you know, partisans of such different politics find this thought enabling. I actually find really deeply disturbing. And also, frankly, if you've done politics, it's never about friend and enemy. It's about non-friends and non-enemies, right? The other word for that's hegemony. The whole vocabulary of, uh, oh, here I'm quoting, the whole vocabulary of economics is basically a vocabulary of avoided war, which strikes me as a good thing. Um, I always thought um, Johann Huizinger had a good answer to the model of politics as the coming together of friends around a shared substance and a fight to the death against an enemy. Uh, the essential form of praxis for him is not war, but it's play. Uh, and he sees all institutional forms, including war, as having crystallized out of play. Play removes from antagonism the necessity for the fight to the death, 
and leaves the loser alive to recognize the victor. And after all, that's the point of, you know, what's the point of victory without that recognition by the loser? Like the Greeks knew that, and it's a thing maybe the moderns forgot. Uh, Hoising is one of the sources of situationist thought that's sort of dropped out of the picture here, and maybe more is the pity. It would be a way of thinking about how forms of life come into conflict, but also how they modify and develop out of non-lethal and non-violent play. Uh, Huizing was interested in institutions, but the Invisible Committee seems hostile to any form bigger in scale than a bake sale. They want forms, but not forms that scale. Uh, every, everything that lives is only forms interactions of forms, emphasis here on lives. And as, as I mentioned, a strict hierarchy of living over dead labor, which I, which I want to question a bit. What the institution promises is that a single thing in this lower world will have transcended time, unquote. Uh, as Harold Innes put it so well, there are infrastructures, you would have said media, that are time binding, and there are those that are space binding. From telegraphy to telephone to television to internet, the world ended up being awash in space binding forms, but maybe time binding ones. Institutions have become impoverished and are under attack. And this would take us to the discussion of Kavanaugh here in the States, right? Maybe the fragmented world calls for more rather than less time binding, particularly now that political time has collapsed into geological time. Collective planetary human social activity uh, has changed geological time, which is measured in multiples of millennia. That's where we are. So sort of historical time has now touched that, yeah? For the first time since we became a species. That's the other name for that's the Anthropocene. Now suspicious of the perverse dialectic between institutions and movements. It seems only that institutions absorb and diffuse movements. And that would seem to me in itself an argument for not dismissing the utility of institutions lightly. But then I'm an institutional person. Uh, my political education as a young militant was in the hands of comrades who ran things, mostly unions. And let me add that they had a much more efficient way of running meetings than general assemblies because the revolution could happen any moment, so we have to like, get everything decided that's unimportant now, right? Rather than institutions, a destitution, a politics of escape and of disappointment, a refusal of historical time, of the concept of a project in favor of a vital joy. Uh, Alexandre Koryev was probably right to imagine that Hegel had sort of inserted God in the form of the absolute in historical time as goal and destiny. But my question would be, is collective human action possible at all without some version of that faith? In an era in which geological time has, in any case, foreclosed many of the more optimistic trajectories for historical time, what kind of history is still possible? There is no project in now other than to make ourselves ungovernable. One has to wonder about the strategic wisdom of this. Elsewhere now notes that the ruling class themselves are anarchists. They do their best to escape and evade, dare I say, destitute, any institutional form that might hold them. This includes those institutions that are residues of past counter-hegemonic struggles, not just by labor movements, but by environmental action and so on. Here lies the whole history of the dialectic between movements and institutions. To whose advantage is it to destitute these institutions then? The people or the ruling class? Certainly, the ruling class seems to rely more and more on the institutions of police and prison. Uh, but is this not uh, made possible by the destitution of all other institutions by the ruling class itself? The function of policing uh, is to make sure that the desired order appears to reign. And maintaining order is the main activity of an order that has already failed. But who caused it to fail? That isn't asked. But the police are recognized to actually not be the opponent. And now it's critical of that strain of anarchism that we think of nothing better to do than get beaten up by the cops. Both state and capital appear as absolutes, lacking internal difference. Capital has taken hold of every, every detail and every dimension of existence. The unacknowledged source of this concept, strangely enough, is Lukash writings of the 1920s. And like him, they insist on the political character of the economy. These gestures are never reciprocal. The political is to be found everywhere, but nothing is ever to be found within the political. 
Just speaking for myself, I no longer find it useful to treat capital as an eternal essence that only changes in appearances. What if this is not capitalism anymore, but something worse? What, is another, what if another mode of production was now grafted on top of capitalism in the way it is grafted on top of the system of ground rent and commodified agriculture? What if this new mode of production was based on the relatively new techniques of information? Thank you, Claude Shannon. What if it was based on asymmetries of information and the extraction of surplus information from the body, regardless of whether that body was formally in a workplace or not? But to even ask such questions would be to reopen historical thought, for which the Invisible Committee would remain closed. One thing this additional mode of production seems to generate is a kind of class location, uh, actually many new kinds of class location. Uh, one, uh, Judith discussed, uh, now calls the crevade, the needy opportunist. Uh, I want to mistranslate that following hip-hop usage in English and call it a class of hustlers. Uh, like the hustle, the side hustle, to be on your grind. It's a language with a more positive valuation in English, which is also an interesting difference. That one could kind of, it's an untranslatable that one might benefit then from mistranslating, right? Uh, but we're talking about those without formal work, precariously juggling gigs and side hustles, all manageable now through digital infrastructures. It results in part from a universal expansion of measurement, and the logic of value now coincides with organized life. So although perhaps we should not underestimate how much this kind of exploitation requires and generates its own poetics as well, Black Mirror might be less a critique of it than its sort of realism and juxtaposition. So it might not all be quantitative. There's a kind of uh, erratic uh, poetic side to this as well. So like poetry is not your friend as the enemy against the present because part of the thing you're opposing is indeed a poetics, but one that's in instrumentalized together with algorithms. Now, bets in the end on the non-quantifiable as sovereign. Ultimately, the real is incalculable, unmanageable. Well, of course, as uh, Bogdanov would say, you make a worldview by substituting into the domains of which you know nothing, metaphors based on experiences uh, from your own social activity. So to be an autonomous activist, everything looks like autonomous poetic action, because that's what you do. That then becomes the universe as you imagine it. And you imagine that to be sovereign. Now, now retrieves, now, now retrieves communism from Marxists, pointing out that Lenin borrowed it from anarchists as an alternative uh, to the concept of socialism compromised by social democrats when war broke out in 1914. Uh, and, and therein lie a million footnotes and endless arguments that would be so boring, let's not have them. Uh, now, as a non-Leninist Marxist, I'm kind of thankful, however, for this reminder. Uh, but there's, there's actually more connection between Bolshevism and anarchism than that. Uh, and there's a lot there to remind us that the valuing of sort of voluntarist action is shared between them and might not be immune to criticism, let's just say. Uh, communism is the real movement that destitutes the existing state of things. And this is a uh, minor detournement, of course, of a phrase from German ideology. Uh, we call communism the real movement that abolishes the existing state of things. And the, the change from one word to the other is subtle, but it actually in, inflects the whole thing. Yeah? Rather than the triumph of the social over bourgeois individualism, it will be a matter of passages between forms of life that are neither. We only have the choice between two crimes, taking part in it or deserting it. And that, I think, is actually really enabling thought even if it does not really provide a, a decision between one crime or the other, that I think I'm actually choosing the other crime. So, thank you. Oh, sure. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ken, so much for that. So, um, what we're going to do is, uh, I think we're going to we're going to we're going to start a conversation, and uh, I'd like to turn to Emmanuel Sada first. Uh, uh, our own uh, historian here at Columbia, and, uh, and Jesus Velasco, and then I'll come in. Um, I, I'm going to be, I think, on the defense side here, so um, uh, defending the text. So, so I'll let you first, then I'll go, then maybe we can hear more, and then we'll open it up more. Stathis also, I think, probably wants in. So, uh, I, yeah, I'm not sure where you're coming in. We hadn't, this wasn't planned in any way. So on the top here, just hit the, j on the top, there's an on button. Um, uh, you're assuming right. Um, 
Oh, just I, I, did I? Did I? <laughs> you too? So in any case, um, I just wanted to 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 raise the question of love, a category that is uh, both in uh, Jackie's and in Bernard's uh, papers, as you know, maybe the positivity of the of, of the now uh, manifest love as what uh, at the center of their vision of communism. You said love and riots, and you, then you developed riots, but you didn't speak about love and. Uh, you know, love against fragmentation, love as the, the, the principle of, of the process of community building, right? So love as praxis really seems as a central, uh, central thing. So there is a long uh, quotation on page 82 of the English version. By the way, I was surprised that the text is not available uh, for free, either in French or in English. You have to pay. Yeah. It's not... It's no, not it's, uh, it's, no, it's not... Uh, and, and I looked for... I had to parrot it. So, but the, the two first ones were uh, were for free, anarchist but not library. not this one. Interesting. The anarchist library? Isn't it? It's on the anarchist library, isn't it? Yeah. I didn't yeah. find. I uh, okay, whatever. It's linked. It's whatever. Yes. Okay. Um, in any case, uh, at least the French one is not. Yeah. I mean, no, French one is not. Yeah. So uh, that that's that's the details not important. So, but but love, right? So there is a long quotation, page eighty-two thing, uh, this continuity being fr between fragments is what is experienced as community. An assemblage is produced. It's what we experience in every real encounter. Every encounter carves out a specific domain within us, where elements of the world, the other, and oneself are mingled indistinctly. Love does not bring individuals into relation. It cuts through them as, as if they were suddenly on a special plane where they were making their way together amid a certain foliation of the world. To love, and go back to uh, Judith's uh, uh, reference, to, to quotation, to love is never to be together, but to become together. If in love, a piece of the other did not end up being a part of us, we would not have to mourn it when separation time rolled, time, when separation time rolled around. If there is nothing but relations, nobody would understand one another. Everything would be awash with misunderstanding so there is no subject or object of love. There is an experience of love, right? So love as the ultimate praxis. So here, I must say, I hear the Gospels. I hear St. Paul. I hear the letter to Galatians 3.28. There is no longer Jew nor Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male or female. One in Christ Jesus, right? So given this is the Paul of, of, of Agamben, the Paul of Zizek, the Paul of Badiou, right? The universal list from below, right? But Paul, non, nonetheless, Paul, so this is the Paul of, you know, of, of universal love, which is also the Paul, the revolutionary, the Paul that abolishes the law, right? Not fulfilling the law, but abolishing the law. Uh, and the Paul who uh, refuses all forms of domination, and, and among them the domination of the law, but more generally the law in terms of language, the law of the logos, right? So page 27 of the manifesto, I don't have it here, when they speak about you know, the defeat of all subsumption, of all abstraction, the return to proper names, right? I think this is, I mean, I think this, this, this is really central, uh, idea very strongly that, you know, if you don't want to have, if you want an absolute horizontality, it has to be based on love and it has to be based on the refusal of any form of logos. Okay. <clears throat> all fine. I'm all for this, right? But in Paul, the problem is that you have the other Paul. You have the Paul with a sword. You have the Paul of love as mercy. And mercy is about admonishing the sinner. It's about telling the sinner <laughs> what uh, they're doing wrong and to take them in the, in the path of the righteous, right? It's, and for me, the, those two poles are inseparable one from the other. So here, I'm not, I'm not raising the question of love to tell that those guys are ultra boys in disguise, right? This is not the point. This is not a point about, you know, uh, doing an archaeology of their thought. Uh, but if love is a, is a solution, love is also a problem. At least for me, the, why love? In the name of what? Who, why, why should I love? Right? And so in the in the in the gospels, it's a command: love thy neighbor. Right? It's a rule, the golden rule. Right? It's a rule that is beginning to us. So, I, what if I don't want that rule? Right? If I what if I don't want to love? 
And also, it's, the rule is in the, in the name of a transcendence, right? Love thy, thy neighbor because you love God, right? The love of God is in loving your neighbor. So if you abandon all form of you know, transcendence, if you don't want that, how do you speak about love? OK. That's great. it. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. So we'll, uh, we'll yeah. OK. So that's going to be one theme that we're going to need to address. Um, uh, Jesus? Yeah, hello, thank you. Uh, this is very exciting. Uh, and thank you, Emmanuel, for bringing up uh, Paul, because when, when I used this, 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 um, yeah, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I, I was um, underscoring here is the theology of the invisible in the invisible committee, instead of a politics of the visible. And that's, uh, one, that was one of the, of the reflections I, I wanted to, to make. Uh, I, I have a, a, just a few more or less separate uh, questions or, 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 or reflections that derive from my reading of now, but also from my reading and, and listening of, of, of you two, of you three, uh, Judith, Jackie, and Mackenzie. Um, I, I, I spent uh, nine months uh, in, in 2018 um, just wandering around the city of Paris in the midst of the commemoration of May 68 and, 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 and doing a, a photo literary project that was a political education or epigraphical political revolutionary education across the city. So there, is, there, is, there, there, there was, and I'm, I'm beginning with, with Rome as a matter of fact, one, one very beautiful wall in the Trastevere that said, Muro Pulito, Popolo Muto. So if, if, your, if your walls are clean, that means that the people is mute, that they are not saying anything. So the Parisians of 2018, and maybe of all eras, have taken that very seriously, and that you know they've written revolution on the walls. Fuck 68. <laughs> that w that's a good one in Baudricourt. Papers for everybody in Arabic, mostly uh, across the city. Or one that I liked very much because it was right by my uh, apartment in Rue B Bobillot. It's the most beautiful art or street art is the riots. Uh, those, those are, you know, you, you, can, you can find them everywhere. Who, who are they? Who are those we? Who is this other invisible committee that is now writing on the walls of the city and communicating with each other um, about what is revolution in, very, in single, very memorable sentences that perhaps have no theory in them other than the practice of writing of this kind of communication. But by that, they are somehow evading something that I feel now is trapped with, which is dialectical thinking. I think that maybe I'm wrong, but one of the things that I feel that is most hampering in this text and maybe not only in this text, but also in the ways we consider this dichotomy between uh, theory and praxis, or between critique and praxis, etc., is dialectical thinking. Maybe those walls say something different, say something that is not just non-dialectical, but that, that is also that a constellational form of communication, a different way of poetic intervention. Poetic intervention, not in the sense of poetry or lyric, but also in the sense of uh, unveiling uh, ways of doing that I find extraordinarily interesting. That's one of the reasons why perhaps the idea of destitution sounds a little bit uh, fuzzy to me. Because in a sense, uh, I do not see, I see on the one hand, like this Benjaminian drive um, that he, uh, 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 that he uh, 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 raises in, in his 15th thesis on the concept of history, that moment, the moment of the poem, you remember, you know, in which the revolutionary subjects or the revolutionary individuals destitute time. 
qui le croirait en dit qu'hérité contre l'heure des nouveaux Josué au pied de chaque tour tirait sur les cadrans pour arrêter le jour. Just stopping the time, destituting time. Um, and, but, 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 but this was a destitution of time in order to create a new watch, a new clock, a new time in a certain way. So I kind of don't see in this process of destitution the restitution, restitution. And restitution is, is an enormously important word, I think, not because it, also, it, 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 it pushes you for this poetical activity, but also because in a certain way it's also a, a dialogue with the past. Not necessarily a, a reactionary dialogue with the past, but a, a, a dialogue with the past. Um, I have, that's why I, I think I like very much um, some poetic interventions also in the United States and elsewhere that do restitute something. I think, for instance, of photographers. I'm, you know, I'm biased that way, but I think of photographers as a good medievalist, I am. So uh, I, I enjoy very much photography. And in particular, I'm thinking of Matt Black and his geography of poverty. That is a poetical revolutionary act that raises so many concepts that are imaginary concepts in the sense of the images. Um, or Bika the Porter, who is uh, doing uh, uh, an incredible work, a three-layered work uh, uh, in photography and Arabic about uh, refugees. So those are the, the, the kind of actions along with the epigraphy of revolutionary words on the walls that I think are also extraordinarily interesting because they, they don't drive, they don't, uh, they, 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 they call for restitution. Um, Rather, so that's that, that phenomenology of the visible rather than the theology of the invisible, which also reminds me of the invisible institution, that is, those churches that were, uh, you know, in which slaves uh, 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 were not allowed, but still restitute some sort of their com collectivity or their collective uh, thinking. Um, Finally, uh, and uh, please forgive me if I am being too long, um, but finally, I, 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 I now makes this distinction between what happened in, or didn't happen in Nuit Debout on the one hand, and what happened, for instance, in Greece, or in Spain, in the Puerta del Sol, in which, you know, they, 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 there, was, there was an incredible amount of activity, intellectual and social and political, etc. And the, the, the bien pensantes, you know, the, the good thinking people in, in Spain called these uh, people reunited or met, who met in, the, in, in, in Puerta del Sol, they called them the perro flautas, which is a, 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 you know, a word formed of perro, dog, and flute. So they were like the new cynics, so those who are accompanied by their dog, right? And, 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 and in a certain way, they, there was a renewal of a poetics and the politics of cynicism that at a certain point, one time, right, right. <laughs> Am I, I'm not dreaming, right? Okay, so, so I, 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 I wonder how do we, how do we toggle, or how, could, how do we rekindle in a certain way that poetics and that politics of cynicism? And very sorry for being so long. Thank you so no, much. No, no, no. Thanks, Jesus. Thank you. So, um, all right. So let me let me let me just uh, come in here from the from the end of the field, maybe, and, and kind of resuscitate some of this here. Uh, I mean, as I was reading it, I came up with the supposition that uh, there's a fragmented nature to the text itself, which fits well with the fragmentation of uh, society that it identifies. And the fragmentation means that actually, what when I, the way that I uh, enjoyed reading this work the most was kind of dipping into uh, passages that don't that sometimes were in tension with each other. But I mean, long passages uh, early on in the English edition around 34, 35, 36 about law and uh, the form of the law and uh, 
Gunter Jakob's uh, theory of uh, the penal law of the enemy, or passages around 80, 81, 82, et cetera, where they really go into the notions of uh, destituent uh, power, or about the police later on, uh, and the history, the genealogy, 116, 117, et cetera. So these, these sections where uh, they are, what I think, um, doing interesting work at, at, but fragmented work maybe, uh, but uh, interesting interventions that would uh, help us think about um, praxis today. Now, the themes in terms of the objections that I heard most were masculinist, uh, so there's this element of masculinist tied to the riot and to the forms of uh, behavior that we typically associate with young, uh, young anarchist uh, men. Right, and, all, and then also certain, a certain kind of um, middle classedness to it, an odd, a paradoxical uh, uh, middle classedness to it in the sense that like, not everybody has an extra room for the Airbnb or, or, or something like that that, uh, Judith, you were talking about. And, um, and so, so those, uh, those seem to be themes that run a lot through the comments today. Um, I, I, in terms of that, I mean, one, one question is whether some of it can be resolved internally. And so on the cortege de tête, for instance, so the cortege de tête, which is this group of much more militant uh, uh, protesters at the front of a protest in France that gets very violent and uh, et cetera. Um, you know, one, one recent interesting aspect about this, of course, was that the last protest, at least the last one, I. I was there for, which was uh, about May 23rd, I think, May 23rd, 2018, there was a real effort to integrate the cortege de tête with the banlieue. So that was, there was this effort to actually have the cortege de tête be much more uh, uh, yeah, I mean, r yes, uh, uh, and so and so. One question, though, is whether the method necessarily is blocked in a certain time period or a certain origin, or whether it could, in fact, become a space for a more uh, diverse uh, forms of resistance. And and certainly, uh, I think it was the, on May twenty third. It was in a. 2018, there was that, and, and in part it was because of the resistance that was mm, intersecting with uh, some of the police brutality uh, in the banlieue. Okay, so so one question is whether there are ways that that can change over time. Um, another, of course, is the important, I don't know, I really sense this Fanonianism in the riot, in the way he was, in the way that the Invisible Committee was discussing the riot and the notions of bonds, et cetera, uh, harken back, of course, to, to Fanon and to earlier periods uh, where there was a sense of uh, solidarity as produced. Now, the solidarity, of course, raises important questions about um, uh, disloyalties, right? And, um, and internal disloyalties. And, and in that sense, in terms of the dis disloyalties, I mean, I, I, I tend to think of whether it's possible, might it be possible to be so generous as to excuse the infidelities or disloyalties of others? Um, I don't know. Um, you know, that, that, I mean, just, just in a completely different context in, uh, you know, the lives of others, right? Um, there is this moment, and speaking of love, the relationship between love somehow in the lives of others and the fact that one ha would have these betrayals by one's own loved ones, right? And can you, would you be able to overcome that in terms of your own generosity towards your loved ones in any event? So there are some, some themes that we could pick up from the critique, but more than that, I thought we could just look at a passage also maybe page 81, where they talk about these notions of destitution. So let me just make it quickly two, uh, two points. Uh, the first is this idea of destituent power is well articulated on page 81, where they talk about spaces that we might find interesting to talk about in this seminar, right? To destitute the university first, right? To destitute the university is to establish 
the places of research, education, and thought that are more vibrant and more demanding than the university is, right? Um, interesting, interesting ideas. Interesting ideas in part because of s what they're trying to do, I take it through their action, is to create vibrant, uh, vibrant spaces of critical praxis that from which we could theorize, right? So instead of thinking of it as application of, uh, application of theory into practice, it's more like, do you find those spaces that are vibrant and do you draw from them something? Okay, to destitute the judicial system, interesting, um, is to learn to settle our disputes ourselves, applying some method to this, paralyzing its faculty of judgment and driving its henchmen from our lives. Interesting concept, right? So, so how to actually uh, find a way to allow the institutions to ultimately wither um, because we find our ways to settle our own disputes ourselves. Interesting uh, situation with the Black Youth Project 100, for instance, where there were internal, um, uh, there was a, a sexual assault inside the Black Youth 100 uh, Project 100, and where rather than going to the judicial system, they had a whole way of uh, trying to address it within the organization, which would be a form of destituting the judicial system. Destituting medicine, okay, and then finally, of course, destituting the government, which is to make ourselves ungovernable. Now, th so so I kind of find some some useful maybe things or provocations here for our own uh, uh, spaces of academia, um, judicial systems, uh, and government. Um, but more than that, maybe, and this is the last thing I'll say, is the way that I was reading the notion of destitution was that it, it's, part, it's a two-part, it, there are two prongs to it. There's creation and there's destitution. And, and it almost seems like a cycle, uh, a cycle where the creative part is the finding something in common is the common is 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 retreating to a common space of one's own and trying to find relations uh, that uh, that could be productive in our own spaces among ourselves and that that's tied then with the destruction. It's always a one-two, I think, right? And on page 78, uh, there's this notion that these, these are, um, we, we, have, we have a moment of uh, creation and a moment of destruction, and they, they cycle almost in a way. And actually, that I found productive and interesting from my own perspective because of the way in which the destruction always leaves us in a place where we then have to rely on something in common uh, that we build, but that we might then want to attack itself. So I, I often think of that in terms of critique as a kind of a recurring critique of production, destruction, production, destruction. So, uh, so there were some, um, some ideas, and I, I thought maybe we could t turn back to our panel before then opening it up again for another uh, round of thoughts. Um, to uh, to address some of these, do you want? Do you want to sort of yeah. Down the road? You picked a a grumpy panel. <laughs> um, no, I um I agree with a lot of what you said. There is a way in which um, their notion of destituting power is in line with an aboli a prison abolitionist project, um, a turn towards transformative justice and other modes of dealing um, with various social ruptures and harms that people do to each other. Um, and I think that it's important to emphasize in the, um, the you know, cyclical flow between um, destitution and production or creativity, they're talking about a form of creativity that doesn't necessarily mean seizing power. And I'm not really sure how I feel about this. I think um, I 
I want to defend the incalculable maybe a little bit more than Ken <laughs> does based on um, his response to the book. Um, I think that you're right to pick up on the uh, Fanonian vibes, at least the way in which um, uh, now resonates with Fanon's existential philosophy. But Fanon also says that this eruption will only last, I think it was two, two to three months, if there isn't some kind of formal structure put in place. Um, and the form that you know he gestures towards is the nation state. So that in that way, it's very different than Fanon. But um, definitely, the whole philosophy of risk is, is I think, pretty Fanonian. The idea that um, there's some kind of experiential or existential transformation that happens in the process of risking your life. And I think there are ways in which um, risk can be binding, um, but I don't think it's enough. And I don't, um, I think uh, maybe the way that I phrased it in my response, um, my uh, response to their emphasis on love and riots sounded like I was being dismissive of riots themselves, but I'm not dismissive, so I just want to make that clear. Um, yeah, I'll let other um, panelists respond. I have much more to say, but there will be time to return to these themes. Well, I... I'd like to tell you a short episode, a real episode. Um, Ventimiglia, uh, it's a small city on the border uh, between Italy and France, and it's a very important, essential crossing point for migrants uh, who arrive on the Italian coast uh, in the very south of the country, um, if they don't die before. Um, and they arrive mostly in Sicily and Calabria. Uh, from Africa and uh, from uh, Syria. Um, last year, a small group, uh, young group of activists, Italian activists, uh, very nice persons, and, 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 and also politically nice persons, uh, inspired by the Invisible Committee, decided to uh, put into practice uh, the, this idea of destitution and the model of the riots uh, as the only real constituent power, no? And um, why not? Why not? Um, the, in the book, the pages on the slogan, Tout le monde déteste la police, everyone hates the police, um, is quite interesting, absolutely for me, uh, shareable. And uh, I have a niece, four years old, last year, who told me, Tout le monde déteste la police. I mean, it's, it's quite. Um, but at the end of, of these riots, uh, which take place in, in, in Ventimiglia, the activists of the small group came back to Milan. Uh, I, I mean, they spent probably some hours at the police station, and it's normal in that kind of, of, of political game. Um, and that's all. What about the migrants? They were in Ventimiglia. Um, the migrants were arrested, and as the European law uh, on illegal migrants prescribes, they were brought back to the point of entry in Europe, so like um, 1,000 miles further south in Calabria, in Sicily. Um, so back to the starting point. And, and, and they spent months to make this trip from South Italy to Ventimiglia. Uh, in, in some cases, one year and a half. It's not uh, a small problem. So this is exactly the reason why I'm so angry with this book. Uh, and and I, I can understand this will to destitute and fight. And, and it's also mine. This, this will and this need to fight. But what about 
this general and very romantic prescription uh, that the only uh, pure politics is destitution and, 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 and this total indifference for real conditions and real subjects uh, uh, into inside political struggle. Uh, th this is, I mean, this kind of struggle in Ventimiglia was um, involving people, migrants, who were really fighting for their life. So in that case, what is the common? I can understand they destitute and they create in, and, and they produce. OK, but the question is, what kind of creation? And what, what kind of production? The, the perception of themselves as absolutely pure political subject? OK, but maybe the price is quite high. And it's on the skin of others. Thank you. I was just reading um, Oedipus at, at Colonus with, with my son, because he has to do it for school, which got me to thinking about uh, Xenia as the gift of hospitality to the stranger out of self-interest rather than universal love. Like, it's, it's a Greek way of thinking, right? Rather than there's, you know, there's, there's no universal love in, in, that, in that mode of thinking. But maybe it's more useful in a way. So I was really struck by finding St. Paul at work in this text. I had way too secular an education to even notice that that was going on. Uh, and then I want to juxtapose that to the throwaway insult that Calvin gets. I don't know if anybody noticed that. My people are Calvinists, so I always notice this, right? So that we're hated by both the Invisible Committee and Bruno Latour is truly strange, yeah? Like, how do you get hated by such diametrically opposed ways of thinking? So, you know, but maybe there's something to be said for our deep pessimism, and I'm, I'm saying our, about uh, the human and its need to be bound by the institution. Uh, so, yeah, that, that struck me as interesting. Um, yeah, I'm a little kind of always um, uh, nervous around what I think of as aristocracies of revolt, and, and I think this is a text of that culture in a way, and it's not mine. This was, wasn't written by my people in that sense. So it's like, oh, okay, that's, that's how you... It's interesting that, yeah, you, you sort of reserve the right to categorise others, but they are themselves categoryless. That's the whole idea of being an invisible committee, right? Um, which then reminds me of the, um, the hidden committee in um, Cocteau's Orphée, right? Like, you know, secret committees has, like, deep resonance here, in a, in a, particularly in a French space. Uh, I was taught by the comrades, always assume there is an informer. This is the first principle. Always assume you're informed on, right? Like, there's no such thing as an invisible committee in that sense. And, in fact, if you're not being spied on, that is a problem. Right? That would be a sign of failure, that you're of no interest. So, like, always assume that. Uh, so, so, yeah, to always assume the disloyal is folded into the, the loyal. Um, and, you know, where I come from, labor movement did settle its own disputes. Like, and that's axiomatic, because you can't go to the police. Uh, and I was present at one, and it's, it's not pretty or fun uh, or legal. But it's, like, I think that at the moment is a really viable question. Like, in what situations do you not want to invoke law and justice at all uh, but find other means of, of settling something? Uh, and I don't have a good, good answer to that. Um, I'm really not um, opposed to the incalculable. I'm opposed to the sovereignty of the incalculable, the, the sense that that is the one thing above all else. And I, I just think the one obstacle to any praxis now is that every knowledge-based form of praxis thinks it's sovereign over all the others. That is the main obstacle to getting anything freaking done. Yeah? Uh, it's like, uh, oh, the scientists think they're sovereign over us, so we must count a will to power about a counter-sovereignty where we have charge of an ineffable that is over and above them is the very thing that's disabling because there's no one knowledge practice that can do anything in this particular world. The infrastructure is too deep, the problems are too big. Uh, just give it up. So much as I love poets, and there is a place for poets, it's not sovereign. It's, it has to be comradely. And why is that not obvious? I don't know. That's it. OK. Uh, all right. So um, I'll, I'll, I think I'll uh, pass the mic to Stathis first. Um, uh, and uh, and then maybe come back to kind of um, the the moral problem of uh, of uh, unin 
perhaps unintended consequences sometimes of our praxis. Uh, yeah, status. Yeah, well, thank you. I don't know why I'm interpolated here, except maybe so I get to answer in my feminine name. <laughs> um, um, okay, because I'm not prepared. But the thing is, uh, I've um, taught this texts in my classes on anarchy. I've had some very interesting discussions with the students. Um, they're driven by a fetishism of negation that I, I find terribly ironic because it's an extension of the depoliticized world that they are uh, trying to fight. And that particular, it's not even homeopathic. The fact that they're not, they they're, cannot account for that is one of the greatest problems. I think my, both the guests, great presentations, and uh, my colleagues have said some beautiful things. I, I have, there are two points of delusion in this text that I would like to point to very quickly. One is the issue of the present, uh, obviously. I think that uh, the question we have to ask is how can uh, there be any, um, uh, how, can, how can any uh, thought be generated entirely from the standpoint of the present? And I mean this not in the sense of the sort of metaphysical uh, issue of creating an outside from which then to speak, that obviously I'm against that sort of thing, but in fact there's an imminent question. Um, it seems to me that the splitting of the self uh, the splitting of the position with, with, within, one, with, within which one is situated is necessary uh, in order to be able to articulate uh, uh, any kind of dynamic thought. Uh, and that's, I'm not saying anything profound. Uh, in Benjamin's notion of Yetzite is in fact quite that. The dialectics that it stands still as an idea is in, in fact a very dynamic idea. It's a pulsating image. Um, so um, the sort of, and, and, and let's not forget that in his mind, that is an act of interruption, is, a, is animated by movement. It's in fact uh, the exact opposite of anything that would be somehow outside of movement, of time. Uh, so the sort of practice that does not interrupt the present, as far as I'm concerned, cannot deal with the present. Uh, so automatically, the, the, the very figure of the present uh, is, is a del that they invoke is a delusion. The second uh, a delusion is this notion of being rendered ungovernable. Uh, that to me, as a, f as a phrase, to be rendered, to render ourselves ungovernable is a, a kind of a fast uh, way ticket to a kind of fetishized suicide. Only the dead are not ungovernable. Uh, I mean, their, their ghosts remain, and in fact, it might end up governing us. Uh, but insofar as, as, as we're uh, uh, living beings, always in societies of some form or another, uh, the point is not to, be rend to render ourselves ungovernable, but to, to erase the difference between those who govern and those who are governed. And in order to do that, we have to actually really understand very significantly and, and in a profound way what it means to be governed and, and that to be governed is, in fact, a position of governing, a certain way of, of participating in power. Obviously, I'm speaking from an anarchist standpoint. From an anarchist standpoint, the governed are not always the oppressed, are, but the ones who know that what it means to be governed. Again, I'm not saying anything profound. It's basic Aristotle I'm channeling. Um, but I think that um, the ease with which they fetishize these notions Destitution is another one, obviously, that's been discussed a lot, uh, and, um, is um, a very, it's the exact opposite of what they, in fact, decrying, or rather, maybe it's similar to the, what they're opposing, a certain kind of fetishism of, of language, uh, which is not even, in that sense, poetic, like yours was profoundly poetic, um, but it, in fact, it's a kind of a, a mechanical language. It is a language, uh, it is the very language that they decry. Uh, from another side, I think it's sort of the language of algorithm, um, the very thing that they oppose. So I'm obviously not on your side. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's fine. No, I mean, uh, that's, that's all right. I mean, although I, I wonder if, like, the, I, uh, the talking about fetishism in this context only seems, it seems unfair unfair to use fetishism for, well, yeah, right. But I mean, maybe it's just because it's kind of uh, concepts that we're not 
used to as much, and therefore it sounds then fetishistic or something. I don't know. Yes, uh, <laughs> I, it was a reaction prompted to, to me by what studies was saying, so I hope it's not idle. Um, something strange happens in my brain. I mean, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, everything uh, that I've been thinking, uh, trying to elaborate, uh, to communicate, to uh, set uh, in motion both in my philosophical and in my militant or political life runs strongly against whatever I read in uh, the Invisible uh, Committee. And uh, therefore, I share many of the, uh, if not all, of the critiques that have been um, um, advanced. Then, of course, I start to reflect that I must be careful because uh, if I go too far in that direction or in a, in a completely one-sided uh, manner in that direction, I'll get into a big trouble with my own grandsons. And uh, they're not violent, uh, but, uh, but they admire this uh, discourse. And so um, I start wondering if the only thing I'd have to tell them is you are wrong, this is childish, this will take you not where you believe you, 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 you want to go, but at exactly the opposite. Yeah. So all these precautions to say that um, a formula like this, we must render ourselves ungovernable. Yeah? It's perhaps more complicated in its uses and its resonances than um, we might uh, uh, think if we just take the words and, and read them literally. Yeah? And this has to do with two reasons, and I stop there. I draw no conclusion from there. Uh, First, um, it's a reversal in terms of the uh, thinking of power of a very old idea, profoundly uh, encrusted and in ingrained in our political and philosophical thought that traces back to Plato and in a sense disturbs, I don't say you're wrong, but you, what, you, what you said when you when you said, we first must look at the fact that if there is government, some people govern and others are uh, uh, governed. So if we forget that, what are we talking about? But the, the origins of Western philosophy are in the discourse proposed by Plato, which continuously explained that in order for some people to be able to govern others, they should be able to govern themselves, uh, which was true or not, but uh, that was the ideal. So first effect of that formula, in a sense, disturb this profound uh, 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 conviction. Uh, and uh, uh, second, other reference. Uh, they have read Foucault, uh, of course, and they make use of uh, uh, Foucault. Now, the last Foucault, as we know, and we find that interesting, but also at some, some, some moments we, we become uh, a little, uh, um, that can also appear to us to be uh, uh, problematic, notoriously uh, said the objective we should have in life, and that includes uh, 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 ethics uh, and, 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 and politics and, 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 and society, would be not, ne pas être tellement gouverné, not be uh, very difficult, untranslatable in a sense, uh, because the uh, uh, resonance in classic French, tellement, means that way, not be governed in that way, in that manner. Uh, but also, of course, pas tellement, not so much, uh, not so much. So, so be less governed and be governed in another uh, uh, manner. And many people who had behind them, uh, 68, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, 
they started uh, uh, thinking and saying, oh, how reformist and careful and limited this Foucault has become in his intentions. So I don't believe that was the, 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 the case. But the formula of the invisible uh, 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 committee then sounds like uh, 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 something like this. How about radicalizing uh, 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 Foucault's uh, uh, formula, lifting any limitations, arbitrary limitations that you uh, 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 would like to put and that you thought he had uh, a gap. So in the end, of course, you get to something like Agamben, undoubtedly. Yeah. And uh, 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 he's been repeatedly mentioned. So I finished, sorry, excuse me, this is bavardage, maybe. But uh, what strikes me is the fact that Agamben loves the people of the Comité Invisible. He goes to their meetings, he speaks, he, uh, 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 he's the star, and he dri also drives, uh, uh, of course, uh, admiration and support uh, 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 for them. Um, that's a tricky game, eh? because in a sense, if you read Agamben to the letter, in Operosita, etc., etc., it's not the destituent, uh, uh, or even what he means by destituent power uh, himself, is not that kind of strange activism that has been, uh, uh, it should lead him to become a mystic in his, uh, in his, uh, in his, in his, in his corner, not to be the the maître penseur of a, 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 a group that, uh, et, cetera, et cetera, So that's a, a nexus of very uh, uh, awkward, in fact, and, and complicated um, uh, uh, questions, which have to do with the meaning of the words, but also with the situation, I would say, and the performative effect that they uh, 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 produce. And I don't conclude. I'm sorry, I apologize. Or, um, or let's say, actually, it's, the, it's our, an Aristotelian phrase, right? It's not Plato, because Plato would never be interested in anyone learning how to govern themselves. Huh? It's Aristotle who says that in politics. But in any case, the, what, if, if it's just simply to radicalize Foucault, let's just leave it at that, it's just an intellectual game. Their whole point of their whole point is that that this is really not about ideas or criticism or or thinking even, but about acting. So the the I'm really trying to look at this from the standpoint of acting. What does it mean to render oneself ungovernable? Uh, in at its ultimate, it means to take oneself out of the realm of society, which only <laughs> I repeat in a kind of provocative way the dead can do. But so, um, yeah, I, now I, I like this kind of trying to cut tranche between these different uh, notions of, of being governed or not being governed. I think it's, I think it's very, it, we should spend some time on this. I mean, the, I mean, the, the, fun, the interesting piece, right, is that, of course, Foucault in that passage says you, you can't not be governed. You can't be ungoverned. Right, I mean that's the whole that's the whole point. That that, that was Foucault's point there. But but and 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 then there are all these kind of there's a recurring slippage to not being governed so much in everyone's uh, whenever whenever they talk about those passages for some reason they always come up with not being governed so much when in fact it was not being governed this way I would argue. But but I like the idea of not of ungovernable in the, or at least playing with it or thinking through it, uh, precisely because it does push against, um, it does push against the, uh, because it's also not the same phrasing as not being governed at all. It's it, being ungovernable. So what I want to say is being ungovernable reminds me of Productively, and I'm not saying this. I, this is this is intended to be kind of a, a compliment. Reminds me of children. Children are ungovernable. 
in a way, or there's something about there's something about that notion of ungovernable. But I don't think ungovernable means not at all governed or something. It's a it's a different form of resistance in the space of governing oneself and others to be ungovernable than it is to be can't be governed at all than it is to be governed in different ways. And so there's something there's something I find productive in that. But do you want to jump in, Dana, on this? And I think it might have been turned off. I don't know. So just turn it back on. Actually, on this interesting debate on ungovernable, that exactly it's my favorite German word, Widerspenstigkeit, and I never find a good way to translate it into English as something unruly. But I I, I can hear some of what I um, think of when I hear this word. Now, but what I wanted to say is, well, I, I was annoyed reading this, and I agree with the criticisms raised. And then when Judith Revel said that this is um, something, and came up again, that this is something very popular among young people, it made me pause a little and think, well, either we can look at this as something to belittle as our own use and say, oh, we like this and then grow out of this, or try to ask, what is it about this? What's popular with young people, and what is it in us which also then must somehow respond to this reality that young people have seen, but might this speak to them. And so what I then now try to think this of this is more maybe as, a, as not answering our sense of confusion, but rather mapping it and trying to read this as something which has not the, uh, which still might be annoying in many parts and sentences, but which has not the aim of being consistent, and which maybe also makes these very general claims and not disclosing that it should be much more situated. So I, just to say this, I keep pondering about this fact that maybe the, it's interesting that this annoys me so much. There are works which I just don't like or find boring, but this outright annoyed me in reading, and it makes me think that maybe this mapping of confusion is something which is, uh, speaks to me emotional. Now, two things still I want to say. If I read this as a map of my own confusion or our confusion, then two themes which maybe annoy me particularly <laughs> I find noteworthy. One is this committing and the pure form, the pure focus on form, this positivity of the riot. And in opposition to this beautiful feminist commune, <laughs> um, which is mapping something real and filling with content, so it reminded me very powerfully that probably too often the sense of what we commit to is not actually situated and committing to people we face, but trying to find a formula, and in the negative, I find this in here. And the second then, I think is um, how, there was something on page 26 in particular where it speaks about we're living through, a, we're contemporaries of a prodigious reversal of the process of civilization. Now reading this, I thought, this is so, this is, cannot be written in Turkey, in India, in Brazil. This can only be written somewhere in the center where we, it's almost the opposite side of this, um, high notes <laughs> speaking about civilization. Now, but then also, we are constantly now speaking about a sense of this is a complete change of time and we're going through some fundamental breakage. So also this passage in annoying me also reminded me of how I'm part of, uh, in my confusion, very sense of uh, losing, or losing sight how this situation might look uh, like from other parts of the globe. Thanks, Dana. We're gonna we're gonna, we got a quick footnote uh, to to that from uh, John. <laughs> uh, and and then what we'll do is we'll we'll come back to our panelists for final thoughts. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, Go ahead. So my comments actually echoing um, much of what was just said. I I've been thinking a lot about this idea uh, that. It, if everyone, uh, if friendship was a relation that everybody had with one another, you wouldn't need the concept of justice. 
Um, yes. Uh, and, um, and so I've been thinking about that in relation to what distinguishes a, a state from a commune, uh, and which is why I want to bring up um, the, the description of the feminist commune uh, that we heard earlier and just draw attention to it in terms of thinking about what sort of practices would be involved in our, in our destituent practices, what sort of norms to reference our last discussion in Praxis 113, what sort of norms would be involved, um, and you almost want to not call them norms because you don't want to call them governing laws if you're going to call it a commune and not a state, but what would be involved and what would that look like? How are we bound together? What are we bound together by now if it's not going to be an appeal to justice, et cetera? Uh, there's um, a whole genre of, very broadly speaking, anarchist text. There's a way in which this one isn't in the narrow sense, but is in the larger sense anarchist text, that, that are texts of hinterlands. They're, they're things that happen in, uh, out of the way of world history, and they're only possible because of that. Uh, so what if one read it in that genre, that this is being written in, in a place world history is not being made, uh, which would then pose the question of, well, where and in what form is it being made? and to attend to it. Well, two, two short points. Um, not too big of a round. So, no, 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 it's short, short, for real. Ne pas être tellement gouverné. It's the exact contrary of uh, being governable. Uh, it's not a valuation, it's the opposite. Because uh, there is no, for Foucault, outside of power. So, so it's... You are governed, maybe not so much, and you are governing yourself, some others, and, and you are not on that, or that side of the relationship, the good side and the bad side. You are involved in relations, and, and they are moving, so, so, and they are different. So, so this is the first. And the second one, brotherhood, friendship, and so on. Yeah, okay. Uh, tell me what is the common at the very basis of the brotherhood or uh, friendship. Uh, if you give yourself this common in advance, you make a classical form of community. And I can understand the critique of uh, the invisible committee on that point. But if you don't build, produce, create something new, uh, which is the common to be, the becoming in common, which is exactly the problem of uh, Judith Butler in Assembly, for example, or in, of, of La Vallée d'Ardo, and, and you will dedicate a, a seminar to La Vallée d'Ardo in, in uh, the Commun, or Hart and Negri in uh, uh, Commonwealth, and so on. If, if you don't work on this point problem, you, you limit yourself to the, I don't know, the edge of the moment the age of the instant, uh, the aesthetics of riots, and, and what remains after? I think it was, it's interesting that, um, I believe it was your comment um, that uh, it sounds like the language of algorithms, because someone actually programmed um, an algorithm that can generate insurrectionist text <laughs> algorithmically. Um, so you can try, you can see, maybe, who knows, maybe <laughs> it's made that way. Um, but uh, but the, also the question of algorithms brings me to, I guess, their conception of governance now, and this is why I kind of like the cybernetic hypothesis. Um, they attend to the algorithmic dimension of power and how it circulates now, and I, f I feel like um, their emphasis on destitution comes out of an awareness that measurement is the precondition for our management. Um, so I feel like there's something I, I, I find compelling about um, trying to resist that 
urge that we probably also internalize to instrumentalize life, to optimize our existence. Um, and maybe it's impossible and there is no space outside of power. Um, there's no way to withdraw from society. I want to hold open the possibility of different socialities and modes of being with each other that um, maybe they wouldn't necessarily agree with, because I do think there's a way in which this text is profoundly antisocial. Um, but I think on the question of becoming ungovernable, for some reason, I didn't really have a problem with this. I have an aversion to a lot of the language and arguments um, in the book, but um, I do think that, you know, if you buy into this idea that um, the tracking of our movements and behavior and this granular knowledge about everything we do and this um, tracking of life itself um, is used as a way to control people, then maybe there is a way in which becoming ungovernable is a good thing for me, at least. <laughs> Thanks, Jackie. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm on board with that. I'm on board with that, Jackie. Here's, here's what I think, right? Um, I don't think, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think that the notion of ungovernable in this text means outside of relations of power or means not being governed at all. So that's, that's, that's my reading of it. In other words, and actually this conversation has been fabulous because it's really helped me come to this conclusion. But I think that when they're saying uh, becoming, to make, ourselves, uh, un, to make ourselves ungovernable, I think it's ungovernable knowing that we are always governed and knowing that power is everywhere, right? And so, so and, it's, and it's, it's not wanting to be dead, as in uh, the only ones who can be ungovernable. I don't think it's wanting, and I don't think it's wanting to be governed differently, right? It's actually, it's only with this text that I realize the discomfort I've always had with uh, what, is, what is critique that it was latent, latent, bugging me. It's always been bugging me, and it's only now that I realize it. it, it it's that, you know, this idea that, oh, I don't want to be governed like this, I want to be governed like that. And no, I don't want to be governed like that either. Right? And that's, I think that's what's so valuable about this idea. I'm not sure what exactly to do with it, but the idea is, right, um, uh, uh, it's not that I want to be governed differently so much as within a space where I'm always going to be governed, I want to be as ungovernable, ungoverned, un, un, ungovernable, right, as possible. OK. Uh, uh, OK, all right. Well, that's a good place to end, then. <laughs> no, if I, but not if I, right. I don't want to have the last oh, word. Okay. I just want to say that if we, I don't, but if we actually, if if we stick to this uh, and uh, um, attach ourselves to it to such an extent, then you know we're taking out of anarchist politics the politics of rule. And as far as I'm concerned, the most important thing about anarchist politics is that it is a certain mode of rule. It's a certain politics. It's a politics of governing, of self-governing. It's not no governing. That's a big mistake. And I mean, in the history of anarchism, this would be completely wrong. So, but, okay, so but, if we but again, so, again, so, again, so again. if we stick to the ungovernable, which is yeah. just simply disruptive, we're gonna just simply disrupt things. I'm, I'm with that. That's cool. But you know, it, it's what Judith has been saying it all along. What's next? But, but again, what, what, but again it's, it's, there can't be a space of no rules. I mean, so on that, everybody here is in agreement in a sense. I mean, there uh, uh, with Foucault and, and with that text. It's not no and and and. It's not a, but it's a question of kind of how far do you go to resist this inevitable being governed, right? How far do you go? And, and, and just saying not like this, but like this might not be enough, at least for me. All right. 
maybe that's what we're doing. <laughs> okay, all right, so hold on. Uh, oh, Jackie, uh, you're going to have the last substantive word, and then I get to say thanks. Um, I was just going to say that there are ways in which in, informal uh, ways of, you know, doing decision making or different anarchist practices can reinscribe forms of like unlabeled governance where people are exerting power over people and forcing their decisions on others. So there's a way, that's what I was talking about when I referenced the, um, the way in which, you know, calls for ungovernability can mask a masculine governmentality. So. Ouch. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, <laughs> did, did, did you need to do up there enough? Okay. All right. So then, okay. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, first, big thanks to Charlene Biondi for translating uh, Judith Revelle's text. Thank you very much. Uh, s under such quick, with such speed and Thank you to Guylaine for getting this all organized. You guys don't realize, but uh, Guylaine's had a very busy last three days, four days. <laughs> and uh, the fact that this kind of happened seamlessly despite uh, other obligations is miraculous, uh, but a testament to you, Guylaine. Thank you. Thanks to our colleagues. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks to our brilliant colleagues, and especially thank you to our brilliant panelists. Thank you so much, and see you at the next. <laughs>